Uh, welcome everyone to the Cyber Summit for Student Success. My name is Vicki Ratcliffe. I'm the Operations Manager at the U.S. Cyber Range of Virginia Tech. The goals for today is to discuss the best use cases for hands-on learning, to share resources, and examine our impact as educators on students who are ready to take on a career in cybersecurity. Dr. Raymond, director of the U.S. Cyber Range of Virginia Tech, will start the discussion with opening remarks. After his remarks, we will open the discussion to our esteemed panelists for the remainder of the event. Participants are encouraged to ask questions during the event through the Q&A interface that's located at the bottom of the screen. And our first speaker today is Dr. Raymond. He also leads the Virginia Cyber Range which promote, provides the same cybersecurity education resources to Virginia high schools and colleges. He's also an adjunct faculty member in Virginia Tech's Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, where he teaches courses in networking and cybersecurity and helps run a student cybersecurity research lab. Before coming to Virginia Tech, David led the Capstone Cybersecurity Curriculum at West Point and was a founding member of the Army Cyber Institute at West Point. He is a retired Army officer with, B with a BS in computer science from West Point, an MS in computer science from Duke University, and a PhD in computer engineering from Virginia Tech. Our panelists today will come from a variety of perspectives, including higher education educators and administrators, industry professionals, and current students. So I'm now going to turn it over to Dave. Great. Thank you, Vicki. And... Um... Thanks, thanks to the panelists. We'll get to the panelists here in a few minutes, and, and uh, thanks to everyone who's joined us today. Um, we are we are recording this, and we will uh, make it available later um, on our on our uh, U.S. Cyber Range YouTube channel. We we do this we do we do um, different kinds of uh, outreach activities at different times through the Virginia Cyber Range and the U.S. Cyber Range, and we have pretty active um, uh, YouTube presence. So uh, I'd encourage you to to take a look at that uh, when you get a chance. Um, I, I'm. I'm uh, happy to be here. And what what I what I have here is just a couple of slides to kind of frame the conversation, and um, and then we'll move on to to some Q and A. And and I like to set the stage for these kinds of events with just sort of a high level definition of of a cyber range and what it is. Um, you know, you, I, I've been involved in uh, cybersecurity education for a long time, and and uh, in the Army cybersecurity training, and have seen a lot of cyber ranges, and there are some commonalities amongst them that, that I think are represented on, on, uh, on this slide. Um, so um, from a technical perspective, a cyber age is virtual infrastructure that is intended to, to replicate real networks and real devices. And the idea is to put students in an environment where um, it look where, where it, or it not only looks like a real network, but it is a real network, right? You want, you want the, the situation to be as realistic as possible. And so we, so we replicate, actual network infrastructure in, in, in virtualized environments. And um, virtualization, you know, make, makes things very flexible and reconfigurable, right? So we can present users with different experiences without having to, to reconfigure a physical network. So virtualization is very important to this, to this whole enterprise. Um, <clears throat> certainly the networks are isolated and um, that's to keep what the students are doing off of the school network or off of the internet um, and that's because some of the things that students do in in a cyber range environment um, it, uh, could be could be actually malicious on the internet, right? You have students who do things like they they um, work with real malware, so they'll be reverse engineering malicious software to identify how it functions um, as as part of their educational activities. And um, you don't want that real malware to get out on, on the internet. They're also doing things like doing vulnerability scans across network segments. And we do that on our production networks, but we only do that in a, in a controlled way and only certain people have, have authorization to do those kinds of activities. If a student is doing a vulnerability scan across a, uh, a, you know, a portion of the school network you know, to, the, to the security team, that's gonna look like malicious activity. So the things that we do in the cyber range um, certainly could look malicious on a real network. So we try to keep things isolated and keep the students where, where they can do, where they can essentially do no harm. And there are there are lots of, of great use cases for cyber ranges. Um, you know, our particular use case we're talking about today is is in cybersecurity education and training. 
Um, they're used by the military to do um, to do uh, uh, you know sort of practice exercises. They're used uh, in industry to uh, rehearse incident handling. Um, so, so lots of great uh, situations where you might find a cyber range, and uh, and we're happy to provide one that is particularly uh, built for the education use case. So then, so then, why do we need cyber ranges? Um, really, it's all about experiential learning, right? We want to put students who are learning STEM disciplines in real situations where that where where they can sort of um, leverage the things they're learning in a hands-on way. And if you think of the STEM classes you've taken in your educational experience, you know, I, I, I think of chemistry classes I took in high school and college, those chemistry classes just wouldn't be the same if you didn't go into the lab and, and practice some of the things that you learn in the classroom. Same with math class, right? You, you learn math concepts in a class and then you do lots of math problems to practice those math concepts. Um, in a computer class, computer science class, um, it's just not the same if you're not like writing software, if you're not doing some programming. Um, and the, what, what's really interesting, I think, from from the, the, the experiential learning perspective is, again, if I, if I think back on the chemistry class and um, may, maybe maybe other folks didn't have this experience, but when I did those chemistry experience, often they didn't turn out the way that that they were expected to turn out. Right. You, you, you know, it's you either either. Um, I, I did something wrong or I got a measurement, you know, incorrect or I did something in the wrong order. And and that's where the real learning happens. Right. When you when you kind of screw it up and then you and then you have to do some investigation and backtrack and figure out, OK, here's what I should have done. Um, but, you know, that 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 sort of learning from 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 failure is um, is an important part of the of the experience. And that's why we want, again want to put students in a real environment where they're not just sort of following a set of steps that they're given. But where they're actually having to sort of discover um, how to how to move forward with the, with the hands-on activity. Um, hands-on labs promote a lot of things, right? Research has shown that hands-on labs promote uh, motivation. They they promote student engagement. You know, a cybersecurity class. I think I think, uh, and I'm a cybersecurity uh, teacher. I think it wouldn't be very interesting if you if you didn't give students a hands-on experience to 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 um, reinforce some of the concepts that they learn in the class. Um, Hands-on labs promote understanding of, of some of those concepts. You know, when I, when I teach um, things like identity and access management, we, we go to a, a cyber range environment and we have students who are, who are doing password audits, right? They're trying to crack passwords. And that really, really gives you a sense of what it means to have a good password or a bad, bad password. Um, Hands-on labs uh, promote problem solving and, and critical thinking skills. Um, and, and and again, the idea is really to prepare students for what they're going to see in the workplace, right? We're, we want to we want to put them in a in a scenario where they're going to do things that they're going to see later in life, and um and, and you know presumably that that's going to help the student have a better understanding of of what their job might be, and it gives their future employers the 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 benefit of those students having having actually seen some of the some of the things that they're going to encounter in the in the workplace. And then the last bullet here, gamification. Um, we'll talk a little bit about gamification. You know, th this sort of takes the hands-on experience and brings it to another level. You know, if you if you gamify the the cybersecurity experience with with capture the flag or other or or other sorts of gamified activities, you know, now you're not only um, getting students to do hands-on things in a virtual environment, but you are you are um, really promoting them to to do some self-directed learning, right? They, they generally in a capture the flag competition, for example, students have to essentially teach themselves new skills in order to be successful. And, um, and you know, that, that, that helps them learn that new skill, but more importantly, that, that helps them develop their problem solving abilities. And, and, and that's gonna help them for their, for their academic career and for their career um, uh, after, after they graduate. So lots of great reasons to have cyber ranges and, and get students hands-on experience with some of these tools. <clears throat> I want to give just a brief history of, of, of our experience here at the at the Virginia Cyber Range and the US Cyber Range. And, and the idea is just to so folks sort of understand, you know, where where we're coming from and why we do what we do. We started this um, this experience actually dating back to 2015 when the, the governor of Virginia, then Governor Terry McAuliffe, um, assembled the Virginia Cybersecurity Commission. And that was a group of 
academics and industry and uh, state government folks who got together and um, had this charge from Governor McAuliffe to, um, to, to really improve the state of cybersecurity across the state of Virginia. And part of that was to make some specific recommendations about academic programs that would improve cybersecurity education in, in, in the Commonwealth. And um, if you think of sort of Virginia and its, and its proximity to the national capital region, it was really all about developing the future workforce of, of um, cybersecurity professionals, both in Virginia and also to help supply you know, federal agencies and the DOD there in the Northern Virginia region. So that was the charge starting back in 2015. And part of the recommendations that came out of that commission was the Virginia Cyber Range, right? And, and this is a state funded platform that is um, provided at no cost to Virginia public high schools and colleges. So, so the charge was provide a cyber range platform. And so that's what we did. And, and you know, we, we had some state funding to do that. And we kind of looked at the landscape back in 2016 of what was available and decided that the, our best course of action was to build our own platform. And um, a lot of that had to do with the, the platforms that were out there and, and you know, the, 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 the um, the uh, sort of customer base that they catered to. And what we wanted to do was build a thing that was was tailor-made for the educational uh, uh, environment. And so we built our own cyber range platform. That is the Virginia Cyber Range. Started that back in 2016. And we've had um, folks using it uh, since since early 2017. Um, and this thing is designed to, to, to scale across the Commonwealth of Virginia, right? So you, you can imagine hundreds, maybe thousands of students that we expected would use this platform on a regular basis, and um, you know it was hard for us to judge how many how many high schools and colleges would use it back then. What we've come to discover is that when you provide a resource like this, um, people use it, and we have we have a, a, a widespread usage across the state of Virginia. Over half of the high schools in Virginia use the the Virginia Cyber Range, and uh, almost all of the uh, of the public community colleges and universities use it. And we have uh, currently about 11,000 enrollments in the Virginia Cyber Range. So that's a student who's in a class this semester that's using our platform as part of their, as part of their classroom experience. So, so what we've discovered is that the usage has been much higher than we anticipated when, when we started this, which is, which is you know, a, a success story uh, on, on behalf of, on the part of the Virginia Cyber Range. Um, and um, and we're, really, we're really happy with what we've seen and um, so, so as as we sort of progressed and, and continued to build out this platform, we we, um, we saw an opportunity to provide to provide a similar experience to others, right? Um, and and it's, it's just so happened that over time we got people from outside the state of Virginia who saw what we were doing and and um, unfortunately didn't have, didn't have the resources to do it themselves, but um, they wanted they wanted to get in, right? They wanted to be able to use the the Virginia Cyber Range and. And we just weren't able to do that with the with the state funding model, right? Uh, Virginia state funding meant we could make it available at no cost to Virginia, but not outside the state of Virginia. And so what we decided to do was find a way to um, to make it available to folks in other states. And so we created this thing called the U.S. Cyber Range. And essentially, what we do is we we um, we charge to, to provide access to the platform. Now the platform is already built, so we don't have to people we don't have to charge people money to build the platform. We've already built that using state funding that we get from Virginia. So um, so what we're able to do is provide um, the, the the same platform to folks outside the state of Virginia um, without without having to, to to again charge to build the platform. We essentially charge what it costs us to to uh, to provide that service, and that's worked really well. We've helped we've helped a lot of folks across the Across the country, with what we think is a is a um, is a well tailored platform for cybersecurity education, while keeping keeping it at, at a price point that that is um, pretty reasonable for most folks, um, and and so that's this is this is just sort of the history how we got to where we are, and if we think of the impact, you know, we we try to measure we measure a lot of things uh, in, in, uh, in our back end, things like, you know, how many students are using us, how many virtual machines are deployed, um, how many schools are, are using us at any, at any particular time. Um, but you know, that, that's, that, that gives us statistics, but it doesn't necessarily measure impact. Um, this, this slide I think is interesting because I, I think this helps measure 
the impact of the Virginia Cyber Range and 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 the, and how it's how it's um, really positively impacted the, the cybersecurity education ecosystem in the in the state of Virginia. And this is just one data point, right? But it's but it's a study um, conducted by uh, some uh, um, a group called uh, Dark Enterprises, and they do they do um, various cybersecurity education related research um, funded by federal agencies and others. And um, this is work they they did. Um, a couple of years ago called Cyber Supply, and it was looking at um, K-12 cybersecurity education in, in several states. This, this part of the study was 11 states to start with, and they've been expanding this over time. But, but um, you know, this, this I think is a good snapshot. And here in the state of Virginia, um, uh, you know, we, we have uh, over, we have cybersecurity classes, offered in 60% of Virginia high schools. And um, as you see that, that, you know, compared to other states is, is pretty significant. Um, and so we, we, you know, have a, have a pretty close partnership with the Department of Education here in the state of Virginia. We help them to develop cybersecurity courses that support the platform that we provide. And then we provide the, at no cost, the platform that the students can use for the experience for the experiential learning. And I think those two things together have really led to, to Virginia sort of leading the way in K-12 cybersecurity education. <clears throat> so here's some guiding principles. And these are things that, that um, we, we think about when we, uh, you know, things that we thought about when we initially developed our platform and then things that we continue to keep in mind um, as, we, as we further develop it. So first, obviously, we isolate student environments, and I talked about that already. Um, the second bullet here, we 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 um, we absolutely want the cyber range to be easy to use for students and educators. In fact, when you when you log into it, what it looks like is a learning management system, right? So we built it to be recognizable to students and educators. Looks like an LMS, but instead of providing courseware to your students, you're providing cyber infrastructure to your students. Um, the third bullet there, we wanted to, we wanted to be available anywhere, requiring only an internet connection and a web browser. So this is a platform that's built in the cloud using cloud native technologies, and that's the that's the the, the um, environment in which modern web portals are built, right? Uh, and um, so so this is a thing that's that's available to students wherever they are with whatever uh, tool they're able to to gain access to the to the internet with. Um, the, the fourth bullet here, su supporting thousands of students and teachers for simultaneous use. I talked about that. It's built, again, it's built in AWS. Um, you know, at, at any one time, we have upwards of 20,000 virtual machines deployed for students, and we have many thousands of users who use it simultaneously. And, you know, what I tell people is, as long as AWS has has infrastructure available, um, the, 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 the cyber range will have infrastructure available. Um, the next bullet, we try to make it cost effective, and that's that's you know that 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 sort of goes back to the the Virginia Cyber Range and the funding that we have to support that. You know, we want to maximize what we provide to students with the limited budget that we're provided by the state, and so we have to make the Virginia Cyber Range very cost effective, and that just translates directly into the U.S. Cyber Range, right? The, any cost saving measures that we take in in Virginia to to um, make sure that we can. Uh, serve the most students at the lowest cost um, translates directly into the U.S. cyber range. Um, <clears throat> second to last bullet here, we give give educators the flexibility they need to support their students. Right, the 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 um, the, the, the the platform is um, essentially owned by the educator. One, once a once an instructor has an account, they are the ones who enroll their students in their class, and that gives the, the students the ability to log in. And the educators, the instructors are the ones who deploy the environments that the students are going to use. So, you know, they don't have to come to us and wait for two hours or 24 hours for us to deploy some environment to, to students. Um, the, the, the educators do that themselves all through our CyberRange uh, um, uh, portal. So it's it's uh, very flexible. Instructors can can deploy infrastructure. That infrastructure can be ready in, in about 10 or 15 minutes. Students can use it if they need to deploy a different infrastructure tomorrow, sort of a different network environment they want to provide, they can easily delete environments and create new environments at any time. 
And then the last bullet here, again, des designed by educators to support educators. Honestly, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the founding director of the Virginia Cyber Range, and I built the thing that I wanted when I was teaching at West Point. I, I, I had, I had uh, um, local infrastructure and a virtualization environment that I spent um, quite a lot of my time having to maintain. And um, <clears throat> what I wanted to be doing was preparing and teaching classes. I didn't want to be maintaining cyber infrastructure, so I built the, I built the thing that I wanted to have, and, and I use it in, in the classes that I teach now. <clears throat> and so this is what we do in the in the cyber range. Um, you know, on the, on the left side of the slide here is Courseware Repository. This is, this is an online repository of content that educators can use in the classroom, right? Things like course syllabi, presentation slides, uh, um, uh, uh, hand, you know, hands-on exercises, lesson plans, all the things that instructors need to go in and teach class. And, um, and this is all provided with a Creative Commons license. So it's all editable. You can use it as you want, make changes. Um, um, and, uh, and, and this is, the, that course or repository is an online repository separate from what we consider to be the range, right? So this is a thing that, that instructors log into and they can, they can search and browse the content and and uh, pull out what they need to use in the classroom. In the middle of the slide here is the exercise area. This is what we consider the range, right? This is where students and educators can log in and um, do their hands-on activities. And then <clears throat> the second bullet in the middle here is the capture the flag environment. We, we also have an integrated CTF environment that I'm going to talk about here in just a second. And um, and so that's the gamification piece, right? That's a that's an environment that instructors can deploy into their class. And, uh, and, and that gives um, the instructors this very flexible platform on which they can um, give students this sort of gamified environment. Uh, uh, and, and they can use that in, in various different ways that, that maybe we'll talk about in a little bit. And then on the right side of the slide here, we, 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 we really wanna build this community of cybersecurity educators. And, and in, in Virginia, I think we've done a really good job of this, right? We've, We've um, worked hard over the years to connect educators together, <clears throat> and um, we, we um, host regular workshops. We, we uh, have our own annual conference, the Virginia Cybersecurity Education Conference, to bring together educators to talk about uh, um, best practices, to share resources. We do these boot camps during the summer, so we bring, we bring teachers together or faculty members together to, um, to help them. Uh, understand how to leverage different resources to to improve their cybersecurity classes. Um, so lots of things that that we have done uh, historically in the state of Virginia to build this community. <clears throat> and now what we're trying to do, <clears throat> excuse me, now what we're trying to do is do the same thing in, with the U.S. cyber range, right? We want to we want to build this community and uh, see some some grassroots efforts that uh, sort of that that naturally grow out of this. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So, so when I when I talk about grassroots efforts, one thing that we've seen here in Virginia is um, we we uh, <clears throat> we have a, an event that's that's um, created and hosted by high school teachers <clears throat> called Virginia Cyber Slam, and this will be this uh, a, a, an iteration of this is going to be uh, hosted later this month, and I'll be up in in uh, um, Fairfax, Virginia, for this. It'll have five hundred students. At um, at George Mason University, these are all high school students for the day, and they do a series of cybersecurity workshops. And there, there um, are various different speakers. It's sponsored by different companies in the region, and <clears throat> this is a thing that is um, created and hosted by high school teachers. But it's not a thing that the the Virginia Cyber Range creates. I mean, I, I would say that if it weren't for the Virginia Cyber Range. This wouldn't be happening. They'll they'll use our platform for this event, but this is sort of a grassroots effort that that these educators have put together. That um, really, I think, sort of brings home what, the kinds of things that can happen when you build this community of purpose around cybersecurity education. So I mentioned capture the flag, and um, so fo folks who are for folks who are familiar with with uh, CTF, we um, in the, the the Virginia Cyber Range and the U.S. Cyber Range, we have our own. Capture the flag platform, right? It's Jeopardy style CTF. Players solve challenges across a, a variety of different categories. Um, instructors who use the cyber range can deploy their own CTF platform, and they and they manage it. So they're the administrator. They can set 
when it's available to the students. They can set if the students are going to play individually or in teams. They can uh, set um, scoreboard so they can turn on a scoreboard so students can see in real time how that what they're doing is is um, measured against the other students or the instructor can turn off the scoreboard if they just want the students to sort of focus on their own efforts um, uh, and, and the challenges are um, things that the the, um, the the instructors can create themselves or they can use our library of challenges to, to pull into the to the CTF so they don't have to create their own challenges and it's used again this is used for for gamification in the classroom you can have students do it outside of class to further develop their skills some folks use it for for exams um so so uh, a variety of ways to use this platform and this is just this is a this is a screenshot of the platform so you see these challenges in various categories and um i don't have a picture of the scoreboard here but the but the scoreboard is sort of real time so as excuse me, as students solve challenges and, and get points, um, they can measure their success against others. I mentioned our conference. Um, this is the, this is the um, Virginia Cybersecurity Education Conference. Of course, this is open to folks outside of Virginia, and, and we often have participants from outside of Virginia. If people are, are interested in this, I, I put the URL up, up at the top of the slide here. Um, I welcome anybody to come join us for the, for the conference. Um, it's um, it, it's a it's a great opportunity to engage with other cybersecurity educators and um, and it might be interesting just to sort of see what we're doing and how we're doing it here in Virginia and, and maybe take some of that home to 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 uh, wherever you're from and, and do this yourselves. So some final takeaways here. Um, I would argue that that virtual lab environments are are more important than ever, right? We really, you know, there's this there's this significant shortage of cybersecurity expertise in in um, in the the U.S. and uh, we we need to make some inroads. We need to give students hands-on experiences. We need to expose them so that they'll so that they'll consider this a career. Uh, and even if it's not going to be a career, we need to expose students so that they so that they know how to defend their own cyber infrastructure, whether they're at home or at work or wherever they are. And then, then I've listed some considerations here, right? When you're thinking about um, what kind of a virtual platform you want to provide, you need to think about, you know, what what's the specific use case for that platform? What kinds of activities are supported? How cost effective is it? How easy is it to use? Can it scale to meet your your need? Um, how long does it take to deploy? Um, and, and some other considerations here. All right, and with that, I'm going to um, hand the floor back over to uh, Vicky. I think. Thank you, Dave. Um, so at this point, I think that we're going to open it up for the panel discussion. And I think, Dave, you were going to lead off with a either uh, quick introductions of the panelists and then move into um, some questions. Yes. Yeah, so um, so what, what I'd like to do is just sort of go around the horn here and have panelists um, pr provide a, a a brief intro. If you could just introduce yourselves and then and then give a little bit of background, um, so, so we know where you're coming from. And I'm all all sort of called names, so we're not trying to figure out who's who's going to talk first. And I I see Pat uh, McShay is already unmuted. So so Pat, you want to um, give us a quick introduction? Sure. It was it was a quick trigger figure that enabled that, Dave. So thank you. Um, so my name is Pat McShay. I'm a program manager with a company called CACI. Uh, based out of Northern Virginia, but with offices all over the place. Uh, we have 23 or so thousand employees. Um, and we have uh, been lucky enough to stumble upon the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative a few years ago as an opportunity to tap into emerging, I'll just say emerging cyber talent from academia. And it has just paid off beyond uh, all expectations. But for me personally, I started my career as a Navy SIG inter. Uh, rode submarines and got to do what was electronic intelligence. Uh, got my degree at the University of Maryland, IT background, and then UMBC for a master's. I saw one of the participants as a UMBC person. I figured I'd throw that out there. Uh, and uh, through a wayward career, mostly in the intelligence community as a contractor, uh, the last several years I have managed a program that provides our customer with a, uh, a, a very well-rounded full, I'll say for, full service cyber spectrum 
general contractor. Uh, so we have uh, people that do any manner of cybersecurity as a professional activity that you can think. And then uh, last thing I would say is out of CCI, what we've really gotten is internships, connect with that community. Uh, many of those kids are now employees, some with clearances already. Uh, we've, we've, it's been very successful for us, it's been a great resource and the cyber range has been a, a critical component of that. Great, thanks Pat. Uh, Angela. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Angela Orbal and I'm faculty here at the University of Virginia. I teach in the Department of Computer Science. Before, so I'm actually a user of Cyber Range for my students. And before I came into academia, though, I spent over 20 years in industry. So I was hands on in industry doing cybersecurity using the tools that, or similar tools that I'm teaching the students now. Thanks, Angela. Um, Jack. Uh, hi, I'm Jack Seuss. I'm the Vice President of Information Technology here at UMBC. But for this session, um, I'm also the director of something called the Maryland Institute for Innovative Computing. And we have a partnership with the state trying to help the state solve key problems in cybersecurity, analytics, AI. Um, and one of the problems they brought to us was thinking about how to do a cyber range. And I'll go into that in more detail when someone asks me questions about it later on. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Megan. Hi, I'm Dr. Megan Garvin. I'm the Associate Director of Computing Education Research and Evaluation for the Maryland Center for Computing Education. We're located at the University System in Maryland, and we work with all of our teaching workforce, so all of our K-12 teachers, all of our teacher prep programs, both public and private across the state, and we are trying to elevate all of their skills in cyber and computing in general. Um, and so we have partnered with MIIC and Jack in order to bring the cyber range to our high schools and our community colleges and four-year institutions. Great. And Michael? Hi, I am Michael. I'm a junior at Virginia Tech right now studying computer science. And sophomore year, I was a user of the cyber range in one of my classes. And I loved it. It was a great introduction to, you know, a bunch of technical concepts that I had no clue of prior to taking the class. Awesome. Thanks. Um, so what I, what I want to start with is... Um, is thinking about sort of the hands-on component, right? What, what's what's uh, what do we what do we need from a hands-on platform? And um, and I have I have some questions that were that were supplied by some of the folks that registered for this event, and then um, we're also uh, looking for questions from attendees. So attendees, please do um, jump on the Q and A button there in your in your interface and and send in a question uh, if you'd like. Um, I'm going to start with. Um, I'm going to start with Pat, actually, and, and I, I want to get sort of an industry perspective on um, what, what, are, what are the sort of the skills and applications that that students you think need to be exposed to in preparation for the things that you would have them do in the workplace? Uh, well, I think that there are foundational technical skills that that a lot of people can check the box on. I'm going to try and answer this relative to what you provide and what the cyber range provides. Um, what uh, what I try to glean out of someone, you know, an interview is an hour with somebody where you try and determine whether they're going to be a good fit for your program. And hopefully they're trying to determine whether you're the kind of person they want to work with. Uh, but um, in, in addition to being a, you know, Linux plus cert or a, a Python guru or whatever, uh, I think the more important thing is the ability to critically think and problem solve. Uh, because that will endure. Um, you can throw any problem at, at me if I'm good at those areas and I can noodle through it. I can collaborate. I can work with my peers, uh, my managers, the people under me, whatever. Uh, but the critical thinking part and problem solving, um, what I what's occurred to me over the years is uh, we have a cyber range ourselves, a, a khaki one. Uh, oriented towards things we do, but we've we've leveraged the cyber, the Virginia cyber range, the U.S. cyber range over the years as well. Um, get people into that environment. It gets them in a. It gets them out of their work environment or out of academic environment even, uh, and they are maybe thrown to the wolves a little bit. But you you learn to collaborate. You see people how, how people interact. People learn how to interact. Uh, they learn how to problem solve, and that's the critical 
uh, skill, not necessarily shortfall, but that's the critical skill that, that anybody who possesses will succeed, I believe. Yeah, I was interested to see that um, when I was up there last, last, I guess it was almost a year ago, um, that you had your own cyber range and you had your your technical team that managed it and and hosted events for each other to, to continue that sort of problem solving journey. Um, yeah, we do. We do quite a bit of that. It's it's uh it's different. It, just like if we went to Lockheed or 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 Maryland or wherever, you know, we're all going to come up with our own things left to our own devices. Ours is oriented towards what we thought we would benefit from, uh, but certainly the collaboration. You know what you provide is is very complimentary. We have a uh, we have an event every year we call Khaki Con, uh, and it's an informal thing where we just try and encourage cyber learning within our uh, company, and we invite people. Uh, from all across the company to come and participate. And it's essentially a capture the flag event. But uh, in years past, we've gone to SANS and we've paid them many, many tens of thousands of dollars to run net wars for us, or we've built content ourselves. Uh, last year, we used the Virginia Cyber Range and it was, you know, if anybody said, oh, well, that was just the Virginia Cyber Range or it wasn't SANS, nobody, no participant noticed or cared. It was good learning, very practical and hands-on. Uh, competitive. There's a competitive element to this that I think is uh, uh, very important, uh, especially growing young people into uh, valuable employees. Um, so we thought we were doing it ourselves, and then for many years, and then we leverage others as we come along. But but Dave's team came up here, supported us for a day, and it it was uh, I'll say it was flawless. It was it was very good, very well done. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. So I'm going to move on to Angela. I, I guess for, from from the from the faculty member's perspective, how, how do you how do you approach that um, sort of problem solving and and um, pr providing some of those practical skills in the classroom? Yeah, and that's exactly what I love about Cyber Range is that I can provide hands-on labs. We do seven different hands-on labs throughout the semester, and so um, it gives the students the opportunity to be able to learn how to use tools for password auditing, for example, to run exploits, for example. Um, the students at the end of the semester, then I use the capture the flag on cyber range as the final exam. And that's really the true test of critical thinking and problem solving, because that's what it's all about. I get rave reviews for that. Um, most students say it's their most favorite final exam they've ever taken. There is that competitive element to it, even though I do close the scoreboard um, because of privacy reasons for grades. And um, there's that gamification component to it as well. I do have students change their team names so I can take private snapshots of the scoreboard and show that in class to show team name, uh, individual team names as to who at least finished the first, uh, finished the fastest, things like that. So. Certainly a lot of opportunity to build hands-on skills. And I tell students, each of these labs, you're learning a skill that industry wants to see. You should be putting these skills on your resume. We do John the Ripper for password cracking. We use InMap for network scanning. We use Wireshark for network sniffing and packet capture analysis, Metasploit for exploits. I said that should be listed under your skills on your resume, along with all of your programming languages. Uh, so they're certainly building a very um, usable and much needed skill set for industry. So, yeah, that's great. I, I um, um, yeah, I, I agree with all that. So um, in terms of classroom use, do you, do you have any, um, I mean, you've used a, you've you've seen this in industry, and you've used the uh, CyberRange platform, probably probably various different CyberRange type platforms in the classroom. Any advice on like how to how to approach um, sort of using it in using it in in a classroom experience, or or you know, it might be outside the classroom. And, and I, I've used it. In, I've used it in both contexts. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, inside the classroom, it's very easy to use. It's it's my favorite one. So I've been using it since the very first uh, Virginia Cybersecurity Education Conference in 2018 at JMU. And that's where I had a much better look at all of the capabilities of it. So I've been using it in my classes ever since. I wouldn't be able to teach my classes, honestly, the way that I do without it. Uh, the approach is easy. 
I am able to log in to the system with my Gmail account. It's administratively easy to set up and manage the virtualization environment, keeps me from having to run a lab, keeps me from having to install and maintain vulnerable systems in a network in the lab, uh, keeps me from having to support hundreds of laptops of students as well, because the, the support team for Cyber Range is very, very nice. Um, as well, it's that safe environment, like you mentioned, so they get to run real exploits against real vulnerabilities uh, without having to worry about doing something wrong uh, since it's a contained environment. Another thing that I really enjoy about it is that um, the course repository. That was probably my favorite aspect of it. Getting everything set up was easy. Getting my environment set up, logging into my Kali Linux environment was easy, but then you're looking at a blank environment. It's kind of like, what do I do? Well, that's where the course and the course repository comes into play. It already is pre-configured with a lot of labs. So I can search and say password auditing, and I can find one or more labs on password auditing, step-by-step -step instructions for the student, very well laid out. Um, pretty much in the form that I could just hand it directly to the students and use it as is. I can also tweak it, add to it as necessary. So the searchable course repository has been the best. And then in my experience, also in the classroom, scalability has been really important. When I first started using Cyber Range back in 2018, I was teaching classes for uh, our School of Professional Studies, adult learners. So our class sizes were a lot smaller. I might have 15, maybe 20 students if I'm lucky in the adult student uh, courses, which is very nice. Once I moved to computer science, I have about 350 students each semester. So running 350 students on cyber range every semester, and it's really no different than running <laughs> the 15 to 20 students um, in terms of administration. So that's been very nice. Yeah, great. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I, I'm going to turn to Michael here, who's who's had the the student experience, right? So, so uh, I'd, I'd be interested in in sort of your thoughts on on you know what what you get out of um, you know if you can imagine a cybersecurity class without a without a hands on experience, and then a cybersecurity class with with some sort of a hands on uh, cyber platform. You know what, what's 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 the benefit and what's the experience you get out of it that you think you'll be able to take. To, to your to your later endeavors. So if my class that did use the cyber range didn't use the cyber range, I I may have fallen asleep in there. It's the cyber range really transformed the class to make it, like you said, it it gamified the experience. It made it interactive and hands on. It was it was really cool. Our teacher did allow us to use the scoreboard feature, so. Personally, for me, I'm a very competitive person, so I loved seeing, you know, where I was on the scoreboard, what challenges I needed to do to get above someone to get second place or first place. I, I really loved it. Um, specifically, though, there are things that the cyber range teaches in a hands-on way that I just don't think can really be taught in a not hands-on way, like just via a lecture i think that things like going through pcap files and wireshark looking at requests looking at packets those things you you can talk about them in a lecture but until you really open up the program and go through these files or even things like steganography in this in the capture the flag like learning about them is cool but then when you start to apply those skills and you you know crack a password for the first time or get a get a thing right on the capture the flag and you see the the green correct pop up like it's it's really cool and it's really rewarding so that's i i really couldn't see the class without the cyber range yeah awesome that's what we're going for michael that's awesome <laughs> i appreciate that of course um so um, I, I want I want to switch to to the Maryland experience here for just a minute and talk and kind of get some thoughts from from Jack and Megan. I guess, I guess maybe I'd start with Jack and just ask, um, you know, you 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 had this um, decision making process to to um, decide a direction for for a cyber range platform to support education in Virginia, and I, I 
or I'm sorry, in the state of Maryland. And I guess I would just sort of ask, you know, what what led you to the to the U.S. cyber range, and and instead of sort of building your own and, and housing it. Well, it, it's interesting because um, before you made the announcement that you were going to be launching on AWS, the cyber range, which probably would have been 2017 or 2018, I was in a meeting with your, um, at the time, your your vice president of IT, Scott Midgriff. And, um, you know, we were sort of talking and I was saying, yeah, you know, we're, we're thinking about trying to launch a cyber range up in AWS. And he sort of smiled and he said, well, um, you might want to wait a month or two. Uh, we've got something that's going to be announced in a, in a few months. And so we've been sort of looking at what you're doing for two or three years. And so what happened was, is the state of Maryland um, as part of our partnership with MIIC came to us and said, we really want to advance cybersecurity education, K through 12, universities, um, and for all the points that have been raised, we need to be able to be having hands-on sort of activities. Um, one of the things that I did early on after they they talked to me is I, I reached out to Megan. I knew about Megan and, and I asked if, we, hey, if we were going with something like the cyber range, um, would this be able to support, you know, what you're trying to be doing for helping to train teachers? And, and she said, of course, you know, that in fact that they were using a lot of the curriculum that they had built for the Maryland State Department of Education. She'll talk about that. But it was it was very supportive. And so then it was really a matter of convincing sort of the governor's office that this sort of activity where we're joining in with um, Virginia and, and Virginia Tech to be using your package was better than UMBC trying to go and reinvent it. And, and the argument that I, you know, sort of used was that um, we could really move quickly and um, be able to have this up and running um, within months, whereas if we were trying to do something on our own, we'd be talking about years. Um, and so um, that ended up being the compelling you know, argument that won the day. And, and to put this into perspective, I mean, we started these discussions with the governor's office in December. Um, in the following April, it got approved by the legislature. I got funding in July and we had our first classes running on this um, in late August of that year. And that's a pretty compelling, you know, sort of use case to be able to say that you're able to be moving much faster than trying to do all these things on your own for all the reasons that you outlined in your PowerPoint presentation that would be there. Um, but that speed to deployment and the fact that the curriculum was there um, and was just really compelling arguments from, from my vantage point that luckily I was able to sell to the governor's office. Yeah, and I hope they're still happy with going down that road. <laughs> well, I, I, I'll just add one thing, which was one of the things that we also did though is, is we, whoop, that was interesting. That was me or that thing? Oh, you're still, you're still there, Jack. Okay, sorry, my, it lost my uh, my window that was Zoom there. Sorry about that. Um, the one of the things that the um, we were able to do is we ended up moving into where we did do some development in two different areas that were a little more localized. But one was is they wanted the governor's office also wanted us to try to be helping with um, manufacturing space. And so um, we've done a lot more work related to focusing our development energies here on the manufacturing and IoT space. Um, and we're also doing some stuff with um, sort of the advanced, what I would call fourth year you know, undergraduate or second year graduate programs where they want some very custom kinds of things um, that they're trying to be using. And so we've had really good success by mixing and matching what you provide um, for that introductory intermediate area. It's perfect. And then when we, people want very specialized things, we're able to be giving them some basic resources to be able to do that. Yeah, that's great. It gives you flexibility to, to devote your resources elsewhere. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, so so uh, Megan, I, I um, I guess I wonder um, 
how how you feel sort of the rollout. I know you're you're kind of responsible for for rolling things out across uh, the education in in the state of Maryland. And I guess I'd be interested in your thoughts on sort of how how that rollout has gone and and what kind of challenges you may have seen along the way. Uh, absolutely. So in Maryland, we're lucky that we only have 25 school systems, and that's 23 counties, Baltimore City, and the Seed School, which is a boarding school in the city. So of those, 14 have agreements in place, but as Jack will tell you, each of them have different issues, and so some took a little longer than others. Um, and of 14, we have at least four that are actively losing their range. So Frederick County is a great example, just north of D.C. They already had cyber programs in place and classes in place. And they had some teachers that had already gone through the professional development that we use with Melissa Dark and Teach Cyber. So they were able to hit the ground running and they've been the most active so far. And Arundel was very interested, particularly since they have a lot of military installations within their borders. And so they first implemented an after school programming and kind of dabbled and got their teachers up to speed. And now they're starting to use it more. So at the community college level, all of our system, all of our community college systems have a good cyber program in place. Um, we don't have all of them on the range yet. Again, we're working through the, the agreements, but 11 of them have agreements in place and six are actively using it with Montgomery College being the most active so far. So the rollout has been a little slower than we'd like, but again, we have to get our teachers up to speed and our teachers are not where they need to be. So it takes professional development and it takes time. It takes handholding. Um, it takes working with the MIIC and with Teach Cyber to get them ready to do what they need to do. But we have reports from students who, like Michael, have been on the range are just really hitting the ground running and really moving forward. Um, accelerating and being able to do dual enrollment classes when they're in high school in order to come out with not only their high school diploma, but with their associates. So we're really excited about that. At our four-year institutions, UMBC is the most active, but we have three other schools also that have signed on. So we're starting to move in that direction as well. So the rollout's been a little slower than we'd like, but like Jack said, those that were ready could hit the ground running and those that need a little more help, we can get them to where they need to be because we have the infrastructure now in place. So, David, if I could just add one thing onto what Megan said, yeah. what's really been the slowdown, which I, I should have anticipated, was the fact that we have lawyers. Um, and the um, even though we're paying for this um, for so that it's essentially a free, um, it still looks like a cloud service to the K through 12 community. And so um, we actually, I, I want to compliment Virginia Tech, we've had to be really flexible in talking with you, working with them. And I and we've come up with agreement now where um, we've got a, an updated agreement um, before we had just a simple MOU that we were setting up saying we would agree to pay for it. But it wasn't sufficient because the, the community college, not the community college, the local counties wanted to have some protections that they would normally have with any cloud software vendor. And so they have all that by act, working directly with you. And we just have an addendum now where we agree that um, MIIC will pay the bill um, each month um, on their behalf. And since that, we, we've begun to have more, um, more movement again in bringing all of the elements over. But no one has sort of raised a concern, but it's really been how do we solve some of the the legal and other sort of requirements that are, are necessary in the K through 12 space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's, um, and, I'll, and I'll say that the, uh, the, the Maryland uh, process is, is um, maybe more rigorous than others that we've seen. And, um, and the fact is, you know, we've, we've in, in each case so far, I think we've been able to sort of get, get to the finish line, right? So it's just a matter of, of the, the lawyers working with each other and, and uh, figuring it out. We're, we're fortunate here to have, um, to be able to rely on the Virginia Tech legal counsel's office, right? So we, we don't have to have our own in-house lawyer. We have legal counsel that we can that we can bring in and and uh, work on those agreements. And and I, I would sort of caution um, if if there are you know folks on online who are thinking of of using a platform, you know, either the U.S. Cyber Range or some other similar platform at their school, the 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 um, the process that Jack talks about with regard to getting a, a software agreement in place, that's often the long hole in the tent, right? Just it just takes a while to get those agreements through through your legal team and and uh, get them approved. You know, from a technical standpoint, it's really easy, but from a from a um, agreement standpoint, it can be challenging. <clears throat> um, so I've got a couple of questions that came in from from some um, from some uh, registrants, um, and, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna read the question, then I'll I'll, I'll sort of uh, pick on a couple of people. 
Um, one of them is how do we help students translate their class hands-on training to experience that employers will recognize? So how do I translate my the hands-on training I get in class to experience that employers will recognize? Um, any thoughts on that before I before I ask? Or I see I see Angela's uh, unmuted here, so we'll start with you, Angela. Uh, sure, no problem. I do give coaching throughout the semester in class and then individually with students as well about that. And you know, I've already mentioned putting the tools on your resume, but I also give coaching on how to talk about the various hands-on activities that we do in interviews, how to highlight that when they're conversing with employers. Um, and I also make sure that the hands-on activities that we are doing are using tools, techniques, methods that employers are looking for, you know, what's needed in industry. So because I do have a 20 plus year industry background, I can leverage that, but I also continue my industry connections and make sure that we're continuing to teach the hands-on skills that employers are looking for. And I've had some great success with that. I've had students come back to me um, maybe after the class, they haven't graduated. Maybe they were a junior when they took my class and they went on to an internship. I had a student come back to me after the summer and said, oh my goodness, in my internship, I actually used Wireshark. And had I not learned it in the class, I would have had no idea what I was supposed to be doing, but I actually looked pretty good in my internship because I knew what to do and the other, the other interns didn't. That was really nice. Um, I've also had other students that have gone on to cybersecurity jobs because uh, they also have a lot of seniors in my class and they graduate a semester or two after um, they've had the class and they've written back too about their jobs and how well the class has prepared them for industry and for the types of activities that they are doing in their jobs, whether it be consulting or smaller companies doing implementation with cyber. Okay, thanks. Pat, did you have a comment? Well, I, I do. I, I don't want to go too far off the beaten path, but when we, uh, uh, I, I do soft skills presentations for some of the local, well, actually not just local, George Mason, Morgan State. Uh, I grew up right next to Morgan State, so I, I have a soft spot for them. Uh, but then try and tell these kids uh, how to, you know, one thing, uh, the difference between a resume and interview and why what's important about each. And uh, like Angela said, I think on the resume, you want to make sure you list those skills as they caution you to not list things that you aren't very comfortable with, unless you also caveat it by saying, hey, I'm a beginner with, I'm a beginning level Python script, you know, person, or or I, I know Metasploit, but I'm not an expert, whatever. Um, but then you also would want to, as a, as a student looking for a job, uh, list out some of the competitions you've participated in. And the resume, it's it's really unfortunate. Uh, the resume gets you in the door. That's that's how I, the resume gets you the initial attention. Your interview is your chance to show us who you are. And so you put things on your resume that you, hopefully are conversation starters, like I participated in the Virginia Cyber Slam event when I was a high school, or I gave up my weekend to do this. I, I'm on my college competition, you know, club, whatever. And then in an interview, I will most definitely spend a lot of time talking about that and not just not to hear how great you are uh, necessarily. Uh, you know, you're the best cryptographer I've ever met. You know, that's, that's fantastic. But I would much rather hear about how you interacted with your team, what challenges you face. If I detect that you're weak on something, but like comfortable talking about it, I wouldn't want to make anybody uncomfortable. Uh, you know, kind of pick at that. And then how'd you noodle through that? That sounded like hey, you went down a rabbit hole and you spent two extra hours on this challenge and gee, you could have spent your time accumulating more points somewhere else. Why'd you do that? And then you get them talking. So it's, I, I, I don't know if this completely answers your question, but resume and interview uh, and, you know, that gets you in the door. It's the starter. And then show us who you are, but all that you, you are more conversational if you have that hands-on experience in the practical learning. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Um, I, I'm going to ask Michael here from the, from a student perspective. I mean, so you, you've learned some things and you're going to continue to learn some more things, right? You're, you're a junior now. So you, so you've got more cybersecurity classes coming. Um, you know, how, how, how do you, how do you think about uh, being able to translate some of those things that you're learning into, into skills that, employers will will understand. 
Sure. Yeah. So I have participated. So when I took the class using the cyber range, that's where I gained all of my initial knowledge. That's where I learned about what cryptography was. How do we make secure passwords? How do we crack secure passwords? How do we use a bunch of these really cool programs and software tools like Nmap and like Wireshark? And when I then once I learned that, then I suck I suck out competitions to further enhance my skills because what I learned in the cyber range, I was directly able to apply to those competitions. And I and like Pat said, I put those competitions on my resume so that employers can ask me about those because I enjoy talking about them. I get really passionate about talking about them. And translating it to future classes, I took this class using the cyber range my sophomore year just last semester and my uh so my first semester of my junior year i was taking a cryptography class as well as a computer systems class so in in cryptography we were learning about these ciphers that i had already learned on the cyber range and as a result i was able to help my fellow students understand them if they had a question about them and maybe, you know, didn't want to go to the professor, but still wanted to get their question answered. And so that was really cool. And then in my computer systems class, we made our own web server. And to do that, you have to have a concrete understanding of what requests are. Well, I learned those from the cyber range. And so using that knowledge, sort of like leaning on that, I was, I was able to gain a a better understanding of what I was able to do and complete that assignment. So definitely the cyber range translates to a lot of other classes and even classes next semester where we're learning, where I'm going to be learning about more network sort of network things. That's where I'm still going to lean on what I learned in the cyber range, even as a senior. Yeah, that's great. That's good to hear. I, I like I like the idea of learning learning things in the cybersecurity class that you translate to. I mean, if you're going to build a web server, you have to understand how people do it wrong and where the vulnerabilities might be, so that you can so that you can avoid those those pitfalls in the future. Um, yeah, that's really that's really neat. I like that. Um, okay. All right. Well, um, I, I I'm going to just go around the horn really quick and see if folks have any final comments. We we don't have any other questions. Uh, from our live attendees. So um, I'm going to quickly go around the horn. If anybody, if, if folks have sort of a final sentence or two, um, and then and then we'll we'll get ready to wrap things up. So I'm going to start with uh, I'm, I'm going to go around the horn on my screen here, and that starts me with Angela. I'm just excited to have been able to participate in this today and share my experience. I think we lost Angela. All right, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to Pat because I lost Angela. Uh, okay, I can I can jump in. Um, the one thing this occurred to me, Dave, uh, in the last couple of days, ever I've been the program manager on this program. It's it's several hundred people. Uh, I interview everybody, and and we go through the technical skills required for a given job. But I always talk to them about their the our culture, our team culture. And it occurred to me this week how closely our team culture mirrors what we would want to see, what anybody would want to experience in a in a cyber competition in a you know a, a CTF event. And our culture is uh, be nice. Nobody ever says that in an interview except me, I think. Uh, but be nice. Uh, it's really important to be able to work with other people. And you might not always agree with each other, but be nice. Um, and then uh, keep learning is the second thing because the cybersecurity field is so dynamic and what, what works today doesn't work tomorrow where a new challenge comes at you, a new threat, whatever. Uh, we didn't anticipate that when we got to, somebody's got to crack the code on this. Uh, so the ability to keep learning is not necessarily what you learn, but it's your ability to keep learning. And then lastly, uh, I think uh, Michael uh, said this interestingly, uh, be competitive. And be competitive just means natural curiosity, pushing yourself to... Uh, solve problems that maybe, hey, maybe nobody's ever seen this one before. Maybe you have stumbled onto something new and unique. Uh, don't settle. And so in a, in a you know, some of these range events that we've uh, participated in, all three of those elements are key to success 
in all of them. So that's my parting thought. Awesome. Thanks. Michael, what, what final comments do you have? The biggest thing that I have is coming from a student, if you are an instructor or anyone who has the power to implement the cyber range in your course, please do. It teaches us as students teamwork skills. I was with a team when I was solving these challenges. I wasn't just by myself. And so it teaches collaboration and teamwork as well as learning those technical skills. And like I said before, you don't just learn them and then and then forget about them. These skills will carry on through the rest of their classes if they're majoring in something related to computer science. It's it's going to be a given. And so the U.S. Cyber Range has really given me the opportunity to diversify my interests and see what is how like web development and networking and all of these really cool concepts that I as a student going into this class did, didn't know about before. And so if if you do have the power to implement this in your class, please do. I found it extremely rewarding as a student. Awesome. Thanks. Jack? So I guess the, the thing I would say is that a lot of times um, when these questions come up, they're sort of presented to technology people. And it would have been a ton of fun to try to be creating what you've created, Dave. Um, but the reality is, is um, it would have also been a lot of work that probably wouldn't have been sustainable and wouldn't have had the already prepackaged curriculum, the community, all of the, the things that actually are the value added in the educational experience for students. And so what I would say to anybody who's thinking about trying to do a cyber range, even if it's saying, oh, we'll just set up some PCs in our lab and you know have VMs on them and be able to do this, is that um, at the end of the day, that's gonna be a lot of work for that instructor. And that's part of what I think is somehow driving people out of the profession is, is we ask him to be superhuman. And the Virginia Tech Cyber Range allows you to be superhuman without having to do all the extra work. You could just focus on what it is in your classroom experience, um, and that can make a huge difference. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Megan, any final comments? Yeah, absolutely. So I agree with Pat, Michael, and Jack that lifelong learning is so key, and we need to make sure that our teaching workforce is also up to skill and they're able to use these tools. So we're working hard across our state to do that, not only with our K-12, our high school teachers, but also with our community college instructors and our four-year professors that are really coming on strong and really want to learn more about this. And as Jack talked about earlier, artificial intelligence has come on strong. What does that mean? What does that mean for cyber? How do you secure these systems? And all of those types of questions are also being asked. So that's another layer in. So first you want the basics and the foundations and then you build off from there. So thank you to the US Cyber Range for, for taking on our state and for helping us. And we continue to work with you as we move forward and upskilling all of our teachers. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks, Megan. I'm going to come back around to Angela because you got cut off after about one sentence. Oh, I did. Yeah, <laughs> hackers are at it again, I suppose. It could be the storms we're having here in Charlottesville right now. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just saying I was uh, grateful to be a part of this and that I'm even more grateful to have the cyber range that I've been using for a number of years now. I wouldn't be able to teach my class the way that I teach without it. And I think that um, the thousands of students that I've taught at this point have really benefited um, from everything that they've learned, whether they go into cybersecurity or not, you know, learning about cybersecurity benefits us all personally as well to protect ourselves, our families from cyber attacks. So uh, it's just been a really great resource to have. And I'm happy to continue to share knowledge with others and, and help people be able to use this resource. Awesome. Thanks, Angela. And th thanks really to all our panelists. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thanks to folks who, who dialed in and, and also to folks who, uh, who listened to this recording later on. And um, I'm going to hand the floor, I think, back over to Vicki just for some final closing comments. Dave, we do have one live Q&A question. Okay. Um, it says, it, the question is, has anyone used these resources for less technical areas of cybersecurity, such as govern, governance, risk, and compliance? Mm. 
Any thoughts on that? We do have courseware that is related to governance, risk, and compliance in the repository. Um, and that, yeah, so that's sort of the less technical on the less technical end. We have we have courseware that covers things, certainly things that are not um that are not hard technical skills, things like ethics and and some some uh some of the business aspect of managing cybersecurity in an in an organization, things like that. So I would I would say those are some ways that that you could use some of the resources for non-technical use cases. Okay, great. Um, so thank you to Dr. Raymond and all panelists for the great discussion. We will be sending out the recording of the summit to participate participants along with a short survey. We would appreciate feedback as we hope to offer more webinars in the future. If you are interested in testing out the cyber range, please reach out. We can provide access to a student demo course with sample labs without any commitment. The best way to get in touch with us is to go to our website, which is uscyberrange.org, and go to the contact us form and request trial access, and we can respond within a few business days. We hope to see you at the Virginia Cybersecurity Education Conference in July, and you can find out more about our conference at vacybereducon.org, and I'll also include that in the email follow-up. So thank you so much for your time today, and I hope you have a good afternoon.